to the book of Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra, chapter 9, for our study. And as we are taking our Bibles and turning to that portion of God's Word, we can dismiss youngsters. Twelve years of age and under can head downstairs. Twelve years of age and under for Children's Church. Lord bless you as you go. Trust the Lord will bless our time in His Word this morning. Ezra, chapter 9. I want to deal with a subject this morning entitled Forgiveness, a Way of Life. Forgiveness, a Way of Life. Now, I know that we're in the month of May, and uh, I really didn't get a lot. In fact, I don't think I've addressed our fervency at all yet, so I might address that in June. I'm still running a couple weeks behind. Uh, I do want to go back to the area of forgiveness. That was our theme for the month of April, and of course it was really based on the fact that we are people who forget, have been forgiven. Uh, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us there on the cross. So it was all built around really Easter and some of those ideas. Uh, but there were a number of things going on, and so we addressed a number of other topics. And so I just want to go back to that for, this, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I have to tell you, I was uh, putting some things away this past week in some, uh, some of these uh, cabinets behind my desk. And in the process of doing that, I found a stack of papers Hey, do you know how to clean a room real fast? You just find a closet or an empty drawer and just shove everything into that and close the drawer and then it's out of sight. It looks great, right? And then you wonder maybe months later, where is that, uh, that article that I wanted or something along those lines? Well, I, I have a habit of doing that as well. And so behind my desk, it's filing, well, it's doors and storage area. And so I was putting a big box of tracks away and came across a stack of papers and magazines, and I thought, you know, I'm, I, are you guilty of this? You take it from one spot, and then you move it to another. You say, I'll get to it another day, and, and another day just really never comes. And so you're just constantly moving it. I said, that's it. I'm going to look at this stack. So I went through it, thinned it out, and I came across a number of articles, and they all dealt with the subject of forgiveness. I, I made reference to this one article here. I ran from life to death. This is a story of a Vietnamese lady. Uh, who uh, was caught uh, by way of a napalm bomb that, was, uh, that had gone awry, came into her village, and it was really from the South Vietnamese people, so it was a mistake. Anyway, um, this bomb really burned this lady up real bad, life-threatening injuries to her left arm and her whole back. Uh, it is a picture that has been around the world, um, Back in 1972, I believe, with the Vietnam War. I'm going I'm to explain all this later on here. But anyway, she's the, she's the young nine-year-old girl running down the streets there of, of, uh, of Vietnam, South Vietnam, with her clothes ripped off her because they were on fire. And she's, Well, her son came to our church, if you remember that, okay? It was a number of years ago. Her son came and told the story. And then I came across the article, and I, I, I think I actually gave this to Herm Luciano, the actual magazine, and I made a copy of it, and this is, this is this one of the stacks of things I had there. So that was one article. Another one was uh, written by uh, James Ray from BIMI. He was formerly the president of BIMI, and now he's with a different organization called Nation. He's going to tell the story of uh, England, Coventry Cathedral being bombed by the Nazis in 19, I think that story is 1940, and all that's left is this uh, the spire uh, of this this tower that some 240 feet and it is left behind to the English people as a memorial saying that hey we are a people that endure through thick and thin but it's got a neat story of forgiveness and so anyway it was all stacked together started going through all this stuff and I really uh, took that as maybe my cue to go back and visit the subject of forgiveness one more time and so that's what we're doing here this morning visiting forgiveness and simply entitling it, it really ought to be a way of life. It ought to be a way of life. So I trust the Lord will bless our time in his word and an interesting passage to really start with in Ezra 9. But I trust that God will have his way as we look into it here in just a minute. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this morning. And truly, uh, we believe that you, in your grace and mercy, have allowed us to rise up early this morning to give us the health and the strength that we needed to get here uh, to worship you, to ascribe worth to you the great God that you are. And truly you are just that. And we pray, Father, that you have already been pleased with the worship that we have rendered you. I pray that our heart and soul have been in the right place as we have sung and participated in this service. Uh, Lord, I, I trust that we are clean vessels so that the Spirit of God can work in our hearts and really accomplish great things. 
Lord, as we look into your word, we, we acknowledge that we desperately need to hear from heaven. We are a needy people. And I'm so thankful you've given us your word to instruct us and help us uh, to stay the course, yea, to know the, uh, and to have the direction that we desperately need in our lives to live a life that is pleasing to you. And so I pray, Father, that you'll guide us as we look into this text and others here this morning. And I pray, Father, for victory if that's the need of the hour here with regard to forgiveness. For, Lord, it is easy, again, to, to harbor grudges. And, Lord, I pray that that wouldn't be the case for any of us here this morning. And, Lord, for that, we'll certainly thank you. So we commit ourselves to you. We ask your blessing on it. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Now, I will say that I've already addressed the subject of forgiveness once. And if you want uh, that, a copy of that message, it's probably somewhere around with a CD. And I really just tell you that we looked at the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I believe it was verses 15 to the end of the chapter, verse 32. And that's where we're reminded to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. And we concluded with that, but there was a lot of other stuff on it. This is definitely more geared toward just the matter of forgiveness. Let me just give you a couple things that I came across by way of the study here. Forgiveness is, number one, like an essential nutrient in the soil of relationships. All of us are involved in relationships. All of us uh, have people around us, whether they're in our homes or workplaces, neighborhoods. It is an essential nutrient in the soil. If you don't have the right nutrients, things aren't going to grow right. Forgiveness is that essential nutrient. Number two, somebody likened it to an element of the air we breathe. It is as important as oxygen is in the physical world. Where would we be without oxygen? We need oxygen in order to survive, and we need forgiveness as well. And so forgiveness is uh, like the element of air that we breathe. It's a natural ingredient in the wholesome environment of Christianity. It is natural. It is something that is... Uh, it's almost a given. It, it has to be there. It must be there. And it's almost like a no-brainer. It is a natural ingredient in the wholesome environment of Christianity. And then last but not least, it is certainly a way of life for the believer who seeks to honor his Savior. So I would hope and pray that, that, that forgiveness really becomes that in our lives. I hope it's already there. Uh, could it be perfected? Absolutely. Uh, I hope that we readily forgive when we have been wronged, even before the, the errant brother, sister, individual comes to us and acknowledges the, er, the error of their way. I hope that the, the spirit of forgiveness is, hey, listen, I just forgive them. I'm moving on with life. I'm not going to carry that with me through life. And uh, you'll see that you're going to be a whole lot better off as a result of it. Sometimes people mistakenly think this, that forgiveness is a change of a feeling toward one who has wronged you. It's, it's feeling-oriented, feeling-driven is what they would tell us that, or at least they would maybe think in their mind with regard to forgiveness. Some teary-eyed sweetness replacing anger and a thirst for revenge. Feelings may accompany forgiveness, but feelings ought not be what drives forgiveness. Why? Feelings are dangerous. If you're, if you're feeling-oriented, you are in trouble. You know why? Because your feelings are going to come and go. They're going to rise and fall. They're going to be all over the spectrum. And so we cannot be feeling-driven people. Are, are feelings a natural part of us? Yes, but they're always to be kept in control of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God must be the one that is driving us and moving us. And the songs are certainly fitting for what we sang today. We're followers of Christ, not followers of the flesh, not followers of feeling. Be careful if your feelings are driving you. You need to back up, put it in reverse, and say, uh-uh, that's where it stops. I want, the, again, the Spirit of God to be the one that's leading me. So I want you to understand that feelings, like love, is really a choice. You know, when we talk about the agape love, we're, we're not talking about feeling-oriented love. That is a choice. It is an act of your will. When you say to somebody, I love you, you are really saying, I am committed to, again, sacrificing myself on behalf of you, regardless of my feelings. I'm making a choice to follow you and to, and to again, pour myself into you or whatever it might be. That's love. Forgiveness is the same thing. It is, again, a choice that you make. It's not something that's driven, again, by our feelings. Sometimes when exercised, forgiveness may go against every self-centered fiber of your being. I know what the flesh is capable of, and so do you. 
the flesh is ugly. The flesh, there's nothing good in my flesh. Uh, and I know the power of the flesh. I know what the flesh can do. Forgiveness, again, uh, is uh, that which goes against every self-centered fiber of your being. You know why? Because your heart and mind will say, well, they're not worthy of it. They're not deserving to be forgiven. They have wronged me and wronged me, and you want me to forgive them again? Yep, that's exactly what God wants us to do. And so it goes against every self-centered uh, fiber of our being. So here it is, true forgiveness. It is a strong, rational decision based on spiritual values, fueled by spiritual resources, and modeled after a spiritual principle of God's forgiveness. So it is, it is based on spiritual values. The values that we hold, folks, are different than what the world would hold. I, I sure hope it's noticeable in your life. Our values are different. I love my neighbors, but I know my values are different than my neighbors. They do things that I don't do, and they would go to places I wouldn't go, and they would say things I wouldn't say. My values are different. And so forgiveness is certainly put into that area. It's fueled by spiritual resources. I am thankful, folks, that when it comes to forgiveness, I have, I have the greatest power available for, in me to forgive. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. Left to myself, folks, I could not forgive. My flesh is weak. And so here's the thing. When we are told to forgive by, script, by, by, by God and his word... I, I'm happy to remind you as I remind myself that God will never, ever ask us to do something that he does not enable us to do. So he'll never tell you to love your enemy if he doesn't give you the ability to love your enemy. He'll never tell you to be thankful in all things if he doesn't give you the ability to be thankful. He'll never ask you to, again to forgive others if he doesn't give you that ability. I have the greatest resource available in me because of the residing presence of God that came upon me when I came to Christ to be able to forgive people. So I have great resources available. And I have a great principle. I have an incredible principle. I know what I am in the eyes of God. I am a sinner saved by grace. Do I deserve salvation? Not, not a bit of it. I don't deserve a moment in his presence. I really don't. And you say, oh, you're just trying to be humble. That's the reality of the matter, folks. I am a sinner. God is a holy God, and not a one of us deserve to be with him for all of eternity. We don't deserve his grace. In fact, that's what grace is. He gave us something we don't deserve. I don't deserve his mercy. That's him withholding from me that which I do deserve. God is an incredible God. To think that he would reach down and save me, save you, what an incredible principle. And if he did that for me, then, then surely I ought to exercise the same to other individuals. So I want to look at a couple things. Number one, some of these things are, again, almost goes without saying, but I want to remind us that, number one, forgiveness is needed. Forgiveness is needed. Where would you and I be if it weren't for forgiveness? Who hasn't, who hasn't sitting in this room this morning been betrayed or slandered or wronged? Is there, is there a person like that on the face of your, I don't care how young you are or how old you are. All of us have been wronged at one point or another. And I can't imagine somebody saying, well, nobody ever really wronged me. No, I don't believe that. You live in the same world I live in. We've all been betrayed or slandered or wrong. And in addition to that, who hasn't been the cause of some of that? And I would almost say probably most of us, if not all of us, sitting here as well. We have all been involved in, again, doing wrong to other people. Certainly to God at the minimum, but to others. Maybe we said something. Maybe we did something. Um, you know, whatever. You, you have to examine your own heart and life, but I want you to go home and think of it. All of us have not only been the recipient of wrong, but we've been the cause of wrong. Now, that might be something new for us to maybe think about, but, but I guarantee you, I think that's the case. All have sinned. All, again, have done wrong. All, all of us. Ernest Hemingway says this. He tells the story of a man by the name of Paco. A father came to Madrid, Spain, a city which is full of boys named Paco, and he put an ad in the newspaper. The ad read this. Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon, Tuesday, and added this footnote. All is forgiven. On Tuesday, according to the story, 
a squadron of police had to be dispatched to disperse the 800 young men who answered the ad in the paper. All of them, all Pacos, recognized that, uh, that there had been wrong committed in their lives, and they were there to get in line to be the recipient of forgiveness. And what all that would entail, they had no idea. But folks, we're all Pacos. We've all been extended forgiveness. God has extended to every one of us here. And so I trust that you and I are in line saying, thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift you have given us. You have given us forgiveness of our sin and received us into your family. The passage of Scripture you open to here in Ezra chapter 9 is really an interesting passage. We're obviously in the middle of a book here, so we're not studying the book of Ezra. I challenge you to go back and do that. Let me just tell you a little bit about Ezra, though. He is the ready scribe. He is, uh, according to uh, Ezra chapter 7, you needn't turn back there, but he is the one that, again, had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra's a neat guy to study. It's good. It's a good book. But I like the prophet. I like this ready scribe. When he comes to chapter 9, he's going to, again, address some issues that are prevalent there in, in, uh, in Israel now. But let me just, again, put it all in its perspective. Remember, because of the disobedience of, uh, of Israel and Judah, both of these nations now have been dispersed from their land. Uh, we know that uh, the Babylonian Empire is overthrown by the Medo-Persian Empire. A king by the name of Cyrus gives permission to Israel to go back and occupy their land and to rebuild a temple. And that was wonderful news. They were in captivity for 70 years. And so a man by the name of Zerubbabel and uh, the high priest uh, Jehoiada, they lead the people back, as it were, and to begin to prepare uh, for the re-entrance of people back into Jerusalem. Something similar that took place back in 1948 with regard to Israel coming, uh, the Jewish people coming back to the, the land of Israel. And by the way, I hope you all follow the news. I hope you're all happy and excited for what's going on there in Jerusalem with regard to that now being recognized, certainly by the United States Embassy and other embassies uh, following suit that it is the capital of Israel. And boy, I know there's been a lot of fanfare and all kinds of stuff that's going on with that. But here's Cyrus. He gives permission. Some of the Jews go back. And the year is now uh, 536 where the temple foundation is laid. It is halted because of some problems of some of the neighboring people. Uh, it will get back on course by way of prophets of Haggai and Zechariah who will encourage the people, hey, listen, we need to start building. Darius will give permission. The second temple is completed, now 516 B.C. Now, those dates might not mean anything to you, but I'm just trying to give you a perspective. And I remember doing this when we were homeschooling our kids and stuff like that. Uh, when, when I would ask them questions with regard to history and stuff like that, I always wanted them to have a time frame. Like if they talk about World War II, I said, well, when was World War II? Uh, let's see, 1600s? Uh, that's a homeschooler. No, 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 that's just... You know, no, so it just kind of helped them put something in perspective, like when was World War II? So when we're talking about this war and you're going to talk about different nations and all that kind of stuff, what year are we talking about? So I just kind of tell you that the year here is now 516, the second temple is completed. But the city still lies in ruins. There's no walls. The prophetic clock of Daniel chapter 9 hasn't begun to tick. And there's a guy by the name of Nehemiah that's going to come back and he's going to rebuild the walls in the year 445 B.C. And that's going to start a prophetic clock to the coming of the Messiah and to the day Jesus Christ comes. And you can read that in Daniel chapter 9. But here's the thing. Ezra, the ready scribe, preceded Nehemiah by some nine years. Five, uh, the year 454 B.C., Ezra comes to Jerusalem. And he's looking at the city, and he sees the temple, and he, and he hears that certainly that temple does not compare with Solomon in all his glory and splendor. And so we've covered some of that already. But he says, still sees a city lying in ruins. No walls, no protection, and so he's burdened. And so he will challenge the people with regard to a number of things that he shares for us here in this book. But one of the things he sees is disobedience on the part of God, God's people. They have come back to Israel, but they are now mingling with the inhabitants of the land. And you know, God has always been very clear that, listen, marriage is very specific when it comes to a believer marrying another believer. We're not to be unequally yoked. It creates all kinds of problems within a home. 
And so God had made it very clear to his people here that, listen, when you come back, listen, the, the, the inhabitants are to be driven out, number one, but certainly don't be marrying these individuals. They're going to take your heart away from God. Uh, case in point, study Solomon, a wise individual. But he, was, he, he got messed up in his thinking by way of the, the number of wives that he took and, and the, the gods that came with the wives. And so the Bible makes it clear his heart was led away from God. And so it's in that context that Ezra here is addressing his people, and we're picking up in Ezra chapter 9, verse 10 and following. The Bible says, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Now that's a good confession. That's a good place to start. What, 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 What can we say to you, God? We are sinners. We have forsaken your word, your commandments. Verse 11. He goes on to say, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people and of the lands with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. He makes it very clear. Don't don't be getting involved in these people. Now let me just say this by way of a quick reference here. You and I are in a world, but we're never to be a part of the world. As already indicated, the standards of the world are not the standards of God. The values are not the same. And yet I want to tell you, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a Christian and a worldly. Sometimes because we're so much like them. And we, want to, we don't want to be misfits. Listen, it's okay to be a misfit for Christ. It's okay to be different for Christ. Not just for the simple sake of being a misfit, but I want to honor the Lord. I want to honor his word. I want to be a people that is set apart to him. And you know, when we do that, God works in and, uh, in and through us in tremendous ways. We then become the effect of light to a dark and, and, and dreary world. We become the salt of the earth. But too often we just kind of want to blend in. And so he's saying, listen, when you go back, don't do that. And yet that's exactly what's taking place. And then he says in verse 12, Now therefore give not your, your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Be different. Don't get involved. Keep your distance. You're going to live there. You're going to live side by side. But listen, be different for the cause of Christ or for the cause of Yahweh, Jehovah here. Very clear. And then he says in verse 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, have they they suffered? Have they paid? Yes, and... and, and like today, for our God is the same yesterday, today, forever, when you and I disobey, there's a price to pay, and so they're going to pay an awful price here, and, and Ezra's recognizing that after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, look at this, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Wow. Mark that down, folks. Highlight that. Hey, listen, do you ever hear that expression? How are you doing? I'm doing better than I deserve. Right here it is. Right here it is. If I got what I deserved, whoo, I can't imagine where I would be. And Ezra is recognizing the same thing. We are sinners. We have violated the commandments of God. We have gone our own way. And yet God in his grace and his mercy has withheld from us that which we really deserve exactly what he's trying to say he says seeing that thou our God has punished us less than uh, our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this what a great God what a great God now while that does not use the word forgiveness I want to kind of springboard off of that I was reading that and I came across and I thought boy this is kind of an interesting passage of scripture uh, certainly dealing again with this area of, of not being the recipient of all that I deserve. And again, that would certainly be God's mercy that I would say that would be prevalent there. But I, I began to really ponder about this idea that forgiveness is needed and how much these individuals need it, the compassion and the mercy of God and, and God again in his infinite grace withholding that from them. I, I thought of passages like the book of Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, I'll just, I'll just highlight a couple things there. The Lord Jesus is doing the speaking, and he's going to remind his disciples that it is impossible that offenses will come. 
So, folks, when you are offended, when you are wrong, when you are let down by sometimes people that are the closest to you, might even be a family member or whatever, you're let down. Don't be surprised. You know why? Because they're made of the same material that you're made of. And while they may have let you down today, you may be the one letting them down tomorrow or next week. So offenses will come. Don't, don't think it's impossible. And then he goes on and says in that same passage, Luke 17, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, what are we to do? We're to confront him, rebuke him, the Bible says. And if you repent, we're to forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, what are we supposed to do? Say, no more. You ran out of, you ran out of your uh, get-out-of-jail uh, cards. Uh, you cannot pass go. You need to pay a penalty here. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, forgive him. Seven times in one day? Yes. I, I would hope that if you really want further study on this, you'll take some time and read uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to the end of the book. Read it. It is phenomenal. It is a king who calls in a servant of his who owes him a debt that he cannot pay back. I think the Bible talks about it being some 10,000 talents. It is, it is buku bucks. In fact, it would take lifetimes, several lifetimes, to pay a debt like that back. He could not be paid back. And so the king has him by the juggler and says, hey, you owe me this. And, uh, and, and uh, therefore, I'm going to sell you and all of your possessions, put you in jail, including your wife and kids and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, the man, as it were, gets on his knees. And again, this is maybe some sanctified imagination where he gets on it. But he does plead with the king, please don't let that happen. And the king, in his, again, mercy says, okay, okay, I forgive the debt. I forgive the debt. Incredible. That man could not have paid that debt back again if he had ten lifetimes. It was, it was the equivalent of millions of dollars in our, our day, uh, our, uh, today's vernacular. So what does that guy do? So that goes, I want to tell you something. If, you, if that were you, once you go out of there feeling like, whoo, I am, I am flying high. I am on cloud. I can't believe it. I have just become the recipient of, of forgiveness, forgiveness of debt. And I think that would carry me the rest of my life. Hey, isn't that exactly what happened to you when you got saved? You had a debt you could not pay. Folks, you could not pay it. Don't think highly of yourself. You could, if you had 100 lifetimes, you couldn't pay the sin debt that you and I have accumulated in our lifetime. In a short lifetime, we are sinners. And listen, you can read the Bible from cover to cover. You can memorize the Bible. You can say prayers from, from morning to night. You can put millions of dollars in You can't pay enough for your debt. Sin, sin is an incredible debt. But there's one who paid it for you. One who paid it for you. His name is Jesus. He came and paid it, and paid it in full. Not partial, paid it all. So how does that leave you? Well, you say, well, I'm still in the flesh. You're right, but listen, don't forget what he did for you. And I'm thinking that this servant should, should never forget that lesson, but he, it's short-lived. He forgets very quickly. And he goes out and somebody owes him money. And it's the equivalent of about a half year's worth of wages. And, uh, and this guy, as it were, falls on his knees, pleads with this, this now servant of uh, his master, and says, forgive me of the debt. And the guy says, no, I'm not going to do that. Throws him in the slammer with his wife and kids. And, and it's an incredible. You owed me a half a year's worth of wages, and this is how you're treating me? Of course, when the king hears about it, you know, it's lights out. Bring that guy back in, and into jail he goes, and the rest is history. But, folks, it's not just a story about a king in debt. The analogy pertains to us, and it's in the context of forgiveness. How good God has been to us. And I would hope and pray that you and I could be a people who would forgive readily in light of, again, what we have accumulated in the eyes of him by way of sin. So, number one, forgiveness is needed. Number two, quickly, forgiveness is costly. I know that sin costs, and you know that sin costs as well, but I want you to understand, forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is not cheap. To extend forgiveness, it may cost you something. And uh, this was a new perspective for me. I, I never looked at this, but it really is, is costly. I want you to go back to look at the book of, uh, of uh, Genesis, uh, chapter 50, real quick here. Genesis, chapter 50. So let's do this as quick as we can. I could read all these verses, but I want you to see this for yourself. 
what I started doing was I started looking in Scripture for the first place where the word forgiveness appeared. I wanted to, I wanted to study the origin of forgiveness, do a word study on it. And so I came to Genesis chapter 50. Now, it's in the context of Jacob dying, and Jacob had 12 sons. One of them is currently ruling and reigning. He is the second most powerful person in the, in the world. He is Pharaoh's assistant, and, uh, and he has been a god sent uh, by way of, again, his position, his power, his influence. But you know the story of Joseph. He was wronged by his brothers. Oh, he was wronged. I mean, there was envy, there was jealousy, and I can't say that some of it wasn't maybe brought on by Joseph maybe flaunting a few things in front of them by way of some of the visions and dreams that he had. Uh, I know maybe he was simply revealing it, but, you know, it's not what you say, but how you say it sometimes. And I don't know how, but I know that he sure stared up uh, the dander of, of his brothers, his siblings. And so when they got a chance, they thought, ha ah, here's the flesh. Don't get mad, just get even. Let's sell this guy. And so they sold him into slavery, and, and Joseph's life for the next 13 years was misery. In a sense that he was in prison, out of prison. Again, wrongly accused even there in Egypt. Back into prison he goes, uh, tells some dreams, forgotten in prison. Finally he gets out, ascends to an incredible position, and is in a position where he can be used of God to protect his people who are, in, who are, are starving to death over here in, in the promised land. So now the kingpin, Jacob, has died. And the brothers are like, what's Joseph going to do with us now? You know, boy, oh boy. So, so here's what it says here in Genesis chapter 50. I want you to look at this here, verse 17. The Bible says this. Uh, well, verse 16, look at Genesis 50, verse 16. And they, that's the brothers, sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died. And they're going to play, play the trump card. Oh, hey, don't forget what Dad said. And so here's the messenger sent to Joseph. So shall ye say unto Joseph, this messenger, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy servants of thy God, of thy father. And Joseph weeps. Joseph wept when they spake unto him. How long have we had this time together already? And you still don't trust me? You still don't believe me? Uh, you, you still you still think okay because dad's gone now that I'm going to get I'm going to get revenge I'm going to get I'm going to get even with you, and uh, Joseph again is a man of God I love the story of Joseph you know you know the the rest of the story here, uh, verse 19 he asked that question toward the end fear not for am I in the place of God has not God in essence led me to this place verse 20 but as for you you thought evil against me but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people hey listen. Would I have welcomed that as a, as a human being, Joseph? Absolutely not. Be sold by my own flesh and blood into slavery, in and out of jail, and 13 years, what a, what a... No, no humanly person would, would welcome that at all. But a spiritual person sees through it all and realizes that, hey, listen, God, you are at work. You have allowed this to happen. And now look at the fruit of that. God, you have allowed this to happen because there's good things that are going to come. But I want you to see the plea of these individuals. Forgive us. Forgive us. It's mentioned twice in verse 17. Forgive the trespass of thy servants. It's mentioned twice. It's the first time the word forgive is mentioned. And so I began to look at that word and study it, and I found out that there are several different Hebrew words that are translated forgive. And I want you to look at one other place. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 4. You will not see the English word forgive here, but you will see the derivative of forgive you'll see the same word that's translated in Genesis 15, 50, verse 17, forgive, you'll see that word bear in Genesis chapter 4. And so I want you to look there quickly, Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve sinned, booted out of the garden. They have a couple sons, Abel, Cain. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel. He kills him. Not good. Genesis chapter 4, verse uh, 13, God is now dealing with Abel because of his wickedness. And in verse 13, Cain says to God, verse 13, Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. That word bear, B-E-A-R, is the same word translated forgive in Genesis 15, or Genesis 50, verse 17. Same word. Now, Cain is correct. 
the punishment, God, of you expelling me from my people. And now the ground is going to be cursed even beyond the original curse. After all, Cain was a farmer. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to have a double curse on the land that I am to farm? It would be like saying to a farmer, all you got is this, uh, this rocky soil to grow crops. I mean, you are going to be cursed above measure. And you're going to be a wanderer. And, and Cain is crying out, but, but, but Lord, my punishment is, is more than I can bear. You're right, Cain. You're right. But the consequences of your sin are your own doing. It's not the fault of God. Sometimes we want to blame God. As if, like, well, God, I got saved, so my life should be changed. Consequences come. And sometimes I want to just, I want to just take a tangent real quick there. Sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing the difference between forgiveness and consequences. I always use these same analogies. If an individual has abused their body, and in particular their liver, by consuming large amounts of alcohol over a period of time so that they get uh, sclerosis of the liver or something along those lines, but they come to Christ, they get saved. Does God owe them a new liver? Not on their life. No, not at all. It's a consequence of their, of their, their habits, their bad, their, their bad practices. Now, praise God, they're saved, and they're on their way to glory, and we'll see them in heaven. But that doesn't say that God has to give them a new liver. A, an individual that smokes cigarettes and contaminates his lungs, and he comes to Christ. Does God owe him a new set of lungs? No, not at all. Praise God, the individual's saved. But listen, the consequences of his actions, he'll, he'll reap that the rest of his days. Forgiven? Yes. But consequences are different. Cain, the consequences of your actions is you're going to be cast out. Uh, the ground is cursed. You're going you're gonna to be a vagabond. You're going to be a wanderer. It's more than I can bear. And that word bear simply means it's more than I can carry. It's more than I can lift up. That's the word forgive. The idea of forgive, bear, it's more than I can carry. It's more than I can lift up. When somebody is asking for, for forgiveness, they're saying, hey, listen, uh, I'm, I'm asking you to lift this from me that you would carry this burden. I, I can't carry it any longer. Do individuals who have been wronged carry burdens? Oh, yeah. One of those burdens is a thing called bitterness. I mean, and that is something ugly. That needs to be lifted up and taken away. I began to think about this with regard to forgiveness and the cost of forgiveness. Don't confuse it with the cost of sin. We already know the sin costs. So, I, 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 for instance, with regard to sin, sin costly. Somebody said it will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's sin. But how about forgiveness? I thought forgiveness costs, and it doesn't come cheap in these areas. Number one, it may involve some kind of material or physical loss. In order to forgive, there may be a material or physical loss involved. Case in point. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? What did it cost God? I should say, what did it cost the animal world? It cost an animal his life. Uh, what did the animal do to deserve death? Nothing. But it cost the animal his life. It cost that animal his blood. There was a material cost to the sin nature of, or to the sin problem of Adam and Eve. And sometimes when you and I forgive individuals, there may be a price, and it may be in the realm of material. It may be in the area of physical. But there's a cost to pay. And sometimes we don't want to pay the cost, so we don't forgive. There may be an emotional cost. Often there is an emotional cost. Feelings. Let's just suppose, in, hypothetically, here in this, uh, in this passage here in Genesis chapter 4, that Abel did not die. Let's just suppose for a minute. So Cain comes at him with, with a knife, as it were, and tries to take his life and does not succeed. You come alongside of Abel maybe a week or two later, and said, Abel, Abel, you need to forgive your brother. He just tried to take my life. I know, I know. But you need to forgive him. But you don't understand. You're right, I don't. I don't. But you need to forgive him. Can you imagine him doing that? Would you do that? Now listen, should there be a price to pay for attempted murder? Sure. And our system here in America would say, you attempt that, you're going to go to jail. It doesn't say I can't forgive you. Consequence to your action is you're going to reside in jail for quite a while to come, 
Understandable. But I can forgive you. Doesn't mean I'm going to set you free or not press charges. No, in my heart I've forgiven you, but here's the consequences. We had an individual, I might have told this story before, of a guy that attended our church many years back in the first pastor in western New York. His name was Chris Flagg. I'll never forget Chris for a number of reasons. He was an incredible soul winner in our church. He was like the Oliver Risha of our church here. This guy had grown up in a home that was dysfunctional with a capital D. In fact, every letter will be capitalized. His dad did some things that were atrocious. I mean, just it almost, it almost shouldn't even be mentioned. Um, what he did with his own daughters, his wife, and remarried, and all kinds of stuff. He was a sick man. And this is, a, this is an environment that this young man grew up in, and he comes to Christ. Chris gets saved, and genuinely saved. He didn't just simply say it. He got saved, and it was evident. As he began to grow in Christ, he realized that my dad is lost. He's in desperate need of Christ. If somebody would have ever told you that Dick Flagg would darken the doors of a church, they would have laughed you off the face of the earth. I am not exaggerating at all. This man had a reputation in the community. He was bad. Chris said, I need to go and talk with my dad. And I need to apologize to dad for some of the things that maybe some of the thoughts I've had toward him, some of my responses toward him. I need to go, and I need to apologize. Now, somebody would look at Chris and say, you are out of your mind. Your dad is the one that's sick. Chris said, no, no, there's been a lot of wrong on my part as well. I'm going to go. And he went. I want to tell you, I am not exaggerating. I'm not embellishing. I'm not making that fish three feet long now. This is the honest God truth. His dad, Dick Flagg, got saved. And he got saved. Dick Flagg ended up at Conowango Baptist Church. When he walked in the doors of that church, he thought the church would maybe crumble down around him. There sits in the church Dick Flagg. And you know how that came about? Somebody was willing to humble himself, swallow his pride. I'm going to go and deal with a sin that needs to be dealt with in my own heart. And he did. And as a result of it, God did something phenomenal. Folks, forgiveness is costly. Chris could have said, he's not worthy. I mean, look at all the people that he has harmed and the wrong that he has done. And I'd say, you're right, he has. But what about you, Chris? God is working in your heart. What about you? And I need to get right. And so he went and took care of it. So, folks, I will tell you that forgiveness is costly. It may cost you something physically, materially, certainly, I would say, even emotionally. Think of, again, what it costs God. It cost him his son. Think of forgiveness coming at the, the price of his son who gave us his life. Think of the reputation that Christ was willing to suffer when he came to this earth. His reputa- it cost Christ his reputation. Remember the houses that he would sit in and have dinner with? Who were the people that he entertained? Sinners, harlots, publicans, wicked people. Remember the accusations that were thrown? If he knew... He did know, and he was willing to pay the price of his own reputation in order to extend forgiveness to those that he supped with. Folks, sometimes we don't think that there's a price in pay in in the area of forgiveness. There's a great price to pay, and I'd hope and pray that you and I would be willing to pay it. So forgiveness is needed. Forgiveness is costly. But I want you to understand forgiveness is powerful as well. It is powerful. And here's the benefits. It benefits two people. Two people. Number one, it benefits the wrongdoer, and it also benefits the one who has been wronged. Both parties become the recipient of a powerful thing called forgiveness. The one who has been wronged can easily become bitter. And I want to explain to you, and the book of Hebrews talks about bitterness actually becoming almost like a a cancer, a spiritual cancer that just kind of eats away within us. And by the way, the one that is bitter is the one that always loses. The other one that is that, that is not aware of your bitterness goes on through life, and they're sometimes oblivious to what's happening in your world. But there's this bitterness. It's a poison. It's a cancer. Coventry uh, Cathedral in England. I wanted this, uh, this story here quickly. I, I thought it was kind of interesting. This, uh, and I'll try not to be too long, but here, uh, November 4th, 1940, Hitler uh, reduced the city of Coventry, England, to rubble. Uh, bombs hit some 50,000 homes, destroying it. And you can go online and check this all out there. 
When the sun came up the next day, they began to see the, the rubbish and the loss of life, and many, many lives were lost. One man walking through the rubbish came across a set of nails from one of the, burning, the buildings that had been burned or bombed. And he took two nails and took a piece of wire and put together a cross. And he put that cross in a place where he would never want to forget it. And it was going to be a reminder of, to him that, that his obligation is to forgive these people who did this dastardly deed. But the story goes on that somewhere through all of this and all of the rubbish, somebody took two spiked nails, big spiked nails, and put them together and sent them off to Berlin, Germany. And uh, uh, James Ray tells the story that while he and his wife were over there visiting in Berlin, he thought that there would be no way in the world that the English people could ever forgive the German people for the damage that they had caused to their city, their town. And yet one day he's walking into a church. And this is, not, this is his story, so you can read it. Uh, he, he quickly, uh, something captures his attention. The, Bible, uh, the, the story goes on, it says, Right in the middle of the room was a cross made from huge spikes, about a foot long each. And the spikes come from Co Coventry Cathedral in England. And, uh, and underneath, again, this, this gift to the people there in Berlin, Germany, where the inscription was written these words, we forgive. Now, the story goes on, but I, I want you to just think about that. You just lost everything. Maybe you lost your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister. I don't know who you might have lost in that bombing. It was a bombing that didn't need to take place. Nothing but the greed of man. We talk about a sick pup, Hitler. He was a sick man. Would you ever find it in your heart to forgive? Well, they did. And I can only imagine, the story doesn't go on and relate, but the whole premises of this is forgive us, is the, the, the title of the article. The, the premise would be that, that through this forgiveness, there's restoration, there's reconciliation, there's life that goes on, that, that we, we will not hold grudges, that we will get beyond this, that that God will give us the ability to, to, to receive you and to love you and to participate with you in, in different activities and things. It's an incredible act. And again, all symbolized by way of this cross. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I thought of, again, this story here of uh, her name is uh, Kim uh, Plu. Uh, and told you the story to some degree, but let me just go on and tell you that, that after she suffered those life-threatening burns to her body, she experienced some 16 operations over the course of the next 14 months just to get her up and moving. Her business destroyed, her family, loved ones, a number of them were killed in, in all of this kind of stuff. She ha even has an ambition to go on to become a medical doctor. That's going to be stripped away from her by way of her country. A number of things, bad things happen. She gloriously gets saved 10 years after that bombing on December 25th, Christmas, 1982. And her life was turned around forever, the story goes on and tells us. You can read the article if you like to. She found a peace and a joy that was absent in her life. She would find it in her life to forgive individuals, and one in particular, she would go and look for the individual that was responsible for that bomb, and she found him. She found the guy uh, that was in charge of this, uh, this, this bomb that got away from him uh, and, uh, and, 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 and forgave the man that coordinated the airstrike. Forgave the man. And with this power of forgiveness, it was extended from dignitaries to celebrities to government officials, this lady has traveled the world. There's a picture on the back of her with Queen England here, uh, Queen of England, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I mean, the people that she has encountered, they want to hear her story. She's still touching lives. Last I knew, she's still living, uh, resides in Canada, and uh, and the power and the beauty that has come from a life. She could have went through life burned and suffering and mad and bitter and angry and and we would say we understand but she said no no when she came to Christ she realized she had been the recipient of forgiveness and in turn I need to forgive and what power is unleashed on people that do that you can think of Joseph as already indicated in prison he didn't hold a grudge against how about Hosea and Gomer can you, be, can you imagine being told to marry this harlot, have children to her, think, okay, that she's well on her way to, you know, settling down, only to leave him and, again, be told by God to go and get her? 
Lord, you don't understand. No, I do understand. And the picture is, that's my people Israel. I have redeemed them, and look what they continue to do to me. Forgiveness is powerful. It's costly, and it's needed. And I hope and pray that forgiveness would be a way of life for you and for me on a regular basis. May God add his blessing to the reading and studying of Genesis and and Ezra and all other passages of Scripture. It is something that is desperately needed in all of our lives on a regular basis, and you and I can never get too far from it. And so I hope and pray that you and I will be a people who exercise forgiveness as a way of life. Let's thank the Lord for our time here.